When your business enters the cloud, you're transferring risk, but you're also adding new risk. How do you deal with sharing your security obligations with cloud vendors? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. Joining me as always is Alan Alford. We are available at CISOseries.com. Our sponsor for today's episode is Palo Alto Networks. And in fact, we have a guest from Palo Alto on this entire episode. But more on that in just a moment. Alan, describe our topic today. So it was a post of mine on LinkedIn about the security implications of migrating to the cloud. We talked about the fact that you're incurring new risk. We talked about the fact that you're now sort of sharing the actual security practice with the cloud vendor. And we talked about transferring the risk, although really it's kind of a bit of a misstatement because ultimately you still own the risk. You're only transferring really the execution and the control. I don't think at the end of the day, the cloud vendor gets in trouble if the bad thing happens. I think it's still on the CISO, right? Although that's going to come up. Yeah, that that actually will come up. That will come up. And I talked briefly about different controls and processes, people technology process, you know, the the three-legged stool we talk about, you know, there's things you can do contractually to hold your cloud vendors accountable and a lot of other perspectives. A lot of folks really honed in on a risk-based analysis for this one, which really always makes me happy. Yes. And to help us mine this discussion is our sponsor guest for today. It is Paul Kalatayud, CSO for Americas with Palo Alto Networks. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. It's time to measure the risk. So Michael Stephen Ruiz of Boldmark said, I'd suggest a risk assessment. What you just said, Alan. Determining your risk appetite and understanding your cloud objectives slash expectations to align with your business model. Review your business technical and security requirements to make sure that the cloud provider can align with it. I also want to add what Christophe Foulon said of Conquest Federal, Risk management should be ingrained as it's a critical aspect of achieving business outcomes. We talk about this endlessly on the show. But Dennis Underwood just flat out said from Cyber Crucible, he said, we make a risk-based decision based on our company's exposure in case of a breach and leak. Okay, so I'm going to have you start, Alan. How does risk enter the picture as you're embracing a cloud provider. I think Michael is spot on, first of all. And so for that matter, so is Christoph, so is Dennis. I think I think the risk conversation needs to be held. You don't go all willy-nilly into the cloud, right? You have to have business reasons for doing it. You have a sound risk assessment performed before you make a move. Challenge your provider to not just meet your security needs, but your business needs and your technical needs as well, right? This is this is a business conversation after all. And ultimately, you know, cloud can help eliminate some risk. It can keep it the same or it can add to it depending on how you actually deploy. So risk awareness and risk appetite become key in that conversation. And it's ultimately, in my mind, every business's decision, and it's usually for a wide variety of reasons, to do the migration, right? Security is certainly something to be considered, but it's rarely, if ever, the reason or the cause for going into the cloud. It's always kind of an an adjunct consideration for most businesses, I think. It's usually motivated by IT uh, who's looking for relief from management burdens, or maybe it's HR who wants to jump into Workday or the travel department wants concur. You know, maybe there's specific applications, specific departments are after. Well, it's usually a... a it's a CapEx, OpEx decision also, too. Sure, sure. It's a business conversation first, and then security has to be considered. And security, if it's done right with a with a forward-looking risk-based perspective, should be there ready to pounce on the conversation and join in in the dialogue and help fine-tune what the results are. All right. Paul, when you're talking to clients, I, I guess let's just start with how do they actually approach you with this decision to move to the cloud? A hey, full agreement with what was stated. It's usually a business imperative. The organization is wanting to move quickly. In reality, in some verticals and industries, I'll even support, you know, I was an anti-cloud traditional CISO in my day, but I, I've seen the light as a CISO and now I see many, many organizations going there. Why were you like that? Just to sort of like connect with others. Why were you like that and why did you switch? Well, I think we're we're risk adverse, right? And so anytime you uh, move into a cloud's uh, digital transformation strategy, one of the things you're giving up is is a perception or perceived control over those assets, right? The infrastructure is no longer yours, the IP, you can't touch it, right? So the visceral response for at least myself was, well, if I can't see it, I don't trust it, right? Understandable. But ultimately, I came to the self-realization that it's not a matter of whether or not I say yes as a CISO or no, in some cases, in some verticals, it's whether or not the organization needs to be competitive. 
organizations now look at cloud as a part of their competitive strategy or just to maintain what the industry is moving towards, right? Ultimately, agility is really critical for a lot of organizations. And as the businesses go, what I would consider customer centric, they start focusing more on the end user and the customer. They start focusing on data and access to that customer. They need to get as close to that customer as possible. So digital becomes a really good bridge to uh, touching your customer. You know, this goes back to what, Alan, you say, quoting your your mentor, that security is the business. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's full alignment. And I think Paul has nailed it here because at the end of the day, putting the customer first, putting the business first, right? The customer first makes the business happy. Business first makes the risk happy. Risk first makes the security happy, right? And and I think if you start from that perspective, it's going to work. And, and by the time you've flown through that pathway, you should get to the point where security is so aligned and so integrated and so part of that customer experience that it's just part and parcel. And in Scott's words, it is the business. Does it play nicely with others? So this is kind of... <laughs> The big issue here, you know, M. Bauman said there are risks with the cloud, which means you never outsource the risk, which is I'll say this is definitely a misnomer. We hear a lot. The risk profile changes, which then needs to be considered and partly addressed in the contract, said M. Bowman. Now, Chad Beckman of TrustMap, who, by the way, Alan, you and I had a lunch with in Vegas. He said, quote, your corporate counsel will tell you that the security annex, SLAs, and, quote, lines in the sand relative to liability and risk must all be drawn out in the agreements with your cloud provider to make this an enforceable reality. Ultimately, you need a mechanism to manage the security service catalog to track processes and discuss the KPIs and the KRIs. So let me start with you, Paul, on this. What does a client understand with regards to their level of risk? Do they, by the way, come because a lot of times I hear this all the time, they're quote, outsourcing the risk rather than your risk profile changes. Assuming you agree with M. Bowman's comment. What's their perception? I absolutely agree. I get a mix. I get a spread of organizations that understand that the risk and accountability is, uh, is on them, but they're still faced with challenging what it means to manage risk when you don't own the technology. In other words, a lot of times it's not about whether or not you agree that a risk management program essentially cascades into digital transformation, it, it really gets into a technical conversation about how do you scale your security program? How do you make it digitally friendly, right? In other words, how do you measure something that you may not have visibility into? How do you gain access and control in a technology stack that maybe your cloud provider doesn't give you the logs and doesn't give you visibility into? And so that becomes the big challenge. Right. And I think the other side of it is very much on point, which is lots of organizations say, great, the whole security problem that I really had a lot of anxiety now that the database has moved into the cloud, you know, my cloud provider kind of manages that data security. And the reality is that's not true. I kind of look at it as a situation where when you go into an apartment building, you know, you, you kind of want the, the building to be managed to a certain level of integrity, right? You don't want any bad people to walk around in your hallways, but ultimately you're accountable for how you lock those doors and open and shut those windows. And that's a very similar analogy to cloud. You ultimately need to measure and have visibility. And that's the big challenge. Alan, how much are SLAs like also, I mean, going so far as customizing SLAs, a core part of this process? Sure. So I, in my original post, I pointed out contractual obligations, you know, is is a key tool in, in the CISO's arsenal when migrating to cloud. I, I'm the one who, you know, uh, proactively posted this. And obviously, Mr. Bauman and, and, and Chad are both, you know, on board with this concept. I think it becomes critical. I, I do worry that some CISOs overly rotate on it. In other words, it's great to have a fantastic contract. Let's say you, you you fight and your lawyers are great and you get absolutely every condition and criteria into that contract that you want. If you guys ever so slightly do this mistake, boom, you owe me tons of money and you know you, you you you've built this brilliant contract. You can't overly rely on that to be the the thing that solves the security risk, right? This is this is what Paul's talking to. It's it, it's great to get it in the contract. You should get it in the contract, but you can't rely only on the contract. And, and is this like you know it's something we talked about in a, in a previous episode? This is like your security program just having insurance, right? Very similar. Is it of the same Very level? Very similar. Paul? Yeah, yeah. To only rely on the SLAs is that the equivalent of saying my security program is I, I pay for insurance? 
Yeah, I would agree. And like any good cybersecurity policy, depending on who wrote it and what is defined as good, anytime there's culpability, anytime there's a level of blame that can be shifted back to the uh, policyholder, in this case, the operator of the cloud, me, the user, you're going to find that those SLAs may not hold very strong water. So in other words, if I look at a majority of every cybersecurity breach attributed or, or, or operated within a cloud environment, a good portion, greater than 75% of those incidences were attributed to human error, speed, uh, misconfiguration, all things that the cloud provider has has done, which has given you keys to the kingdom and said, okay, you have keys. It's now on you to determine how you're going to manage this data. So that also just plays into this whole idea that you have to make sure that you have strong SLAs as table stakes, but ultimately where the probability of risk is, is, a tr- is usually going to be human or something that the, the SLAs are not going to cover. Can there ever be agreement on this? Aaron Weinberg of Hartman Executive Advisors puts forth a very, very good concern. And it has to do with specifying requirements in the contract, which we were just discussing. And he said, that may work for large organizations, but as someone who works in the SMB market, I almost never succeed with this. How would you address this challenge? Uh, I'll start with you, Alan. So Aaron's got a good point here. Some companies simply don't have the clout to, to push a big vendor around, nor do they have the legal team to address every single contract to the degree they'd like to, right? I don't know that I've got some great suggestions here, but you know, as we talked about at the beginning of the show here, it's people, process, and technology, right? It's the three-legged stool. So if you can't rely overly much on contract, then focus on what you can do with process, with tools, with people. Get some basic tooling in place so you can have as much visibility into that new cloud environment as you can. Get the tools to lock it down as best you can. Control access into it and out of it. You know, all the major cloud providers, if you're talking about infrastructure and platform as a service, offer a wealth of security tools. Some are included, some are a little bit extra, right? But there's also lots of local tools you can be using, like CASB. There's there's a lot of things you can do beyond the contracts. And this is what I was saying earlier. They're great to have, but you can't rely upon them exclusively. You still want to have all the sound practice and all the sound tooling in place. So what, any other advice to add to that, Paul? You know, and I think this is a great question, Aaron, because, you know, a huge percentage of our audience fits into his category. Yeah, I think ultimately the SMB market is not going to be very successful in uh, negotiating favorable terms. I will just mention my my experience in negotiating. The response I got back from one of the cloud providers was, "We're not custom. You know, we're the we're the large retailer of of or large wholesaler of server compute." So they also build their business models to scale in such a way they want you to be able to transact with them with a credit card. They don't expect lawyers on both sides to uh, negotiate because that kind of dilutes their value proposition as far as cost. So that being said, I'll agree with Alan and just say that ultimately what what organizations, big and small, need is guardrails. You need to be able to set automation. You need to be able to define a security strategy that, that creates... a achieves agility while also defining the parameters and boundaries of what you're willing to do as far as risk tolerance and let those organizations operate within that speed. But if they do hit a wall or bump into a guardrail, right, that's the reminder that security is still important. And in some cases, what they're trying to do, even in an automated fashion, may not be achievable. You know, I'm getting the sense when I hear both of you talk about this, that people talk about SLAs, I guess, a little too often. It's like, guys, yeah, it's kind of table stakes, it's like having any kind of contract in business, but stop relying on it so much. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. And I'll even give you a good example. I've seen cloud providers sign business social agreements, which is a very usually a very strict contract in healthcare that really puts the service chain or the vendors you're doing business with at notice that they're have they're, that they may be dealing with healthcare data or privacy data. And one agreement I saw was basically an agreement, agree to disagree, meaning they 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 contractually signed a business social agreement. And if you looked at it, it basically said they make themselves fully indemnified of all liability, right? So devil's in the details. Sometimes it's it's not a matter of whether or not someone's going to sign a contract. It's what, what you're going to do to hold them accountable to that agreement. And if they're indemnifying themselves and basically agreeing to disagree, I would say that contract really doesn't do much aside from check a box when it comes to compliance. One of the other things I want to mention is what Ron F. Del Rosario of SAP said, per Aaron Weinberg's concern, this is one of the primary reasons the Cloud Security Alliance CSA exists. They have helpful reference materials such as the Cloud Controls Matrix, CCM, 
and Consensus Assessment Initiative Questionnaire, CAIQ. They are constantly updated to reflect the current threat landscape. And I know you, Alan, are a big fan, correct? I'm a huge fan of CSA. I've been using them for years now. I've got friends that are on their various boards around the country. The Cloud Controls Matrix, the CCM, is a fantastic resource. You know me, I'm always talking about let's be risk-based and not compliance-based. But at the end of the day, as we've talked about in other shows, you know, when you're starting from scratch, you start with compliance-based. And the CCM is this incredibly valuable tool that lets you map to absolutely every framework out there, right? You can take your new cloud play, your new proposition, your new thoughts that you're going to migrate, and you can you can look at COBIT and, and ITIL and ISO 27001 and 27017 and 18 and, and PCI and HIPAA and all of these fantastic, you know, regulatory frameworks and, and legal frameworks and, and compliance frameworks. And you can really look at your cloud versus those things and, and break it down very simply. That's what the CCM does for you. And then the CAIQ, I'll be honest, until I read that comment, I didn't even know about this one. And I went and immediately downloaded it and read it. It's a phenomenal little tool. We all do vendor questionnaires. And as somebody who's been both the vendor and the not vendor, I've been on both sides of the vendor questionnaires. CAIQ is a really, really nice, clean questionnaire aimed at the cloud provider. And it's a guide for the people who may not know which questions to ask of their cloud provider to say, hey, run them through this gauntlet. And I think it's a phenomenal resource as well. What aspects haven't been considered? Brian Fanny of Orbit has said, it would be good to hear of models that help account for the added expense of new security controls that may need to be implemented. This is kind of like the guardrails comment that you said, Paul. So I'll just ask, what are those new controls and expenses that people don't realize they're getting into when they're going to this sort of digital first strategy of moving into the cloud, Paul? I think it, it's it's really about trying to figure out what type of costs are associated. And I think one of the big ones that a lot of people don't really account for is the is the change in talent, calibration of talent, the mindset that may be needed in order to sustain this security control. In some cases, if you're in a serverless environment, there is no network, there is no server, there's no firewall, there's no X, Y, and Z. Those controls still need to exist, and they do exist and live in certain types of product capabilities, but it's not your traditional network engineer that's going to be the one that might be able to naturally meet that need. And so a lot of organizations need to be thinking about the specific technologies that work in those environments, what I call cloud-native and what type of talent is necessary and mindset is necessary in order to, to support that control. And just diverging just for a second here, besides the obvious of what you've said already, but are there issues with regard to a cloud move that you find almost nobody takes into consideration? You're like, you know, I got to say this to everybody because nobody thinks about this. The one that nobody thinks about, and I think it's kind of an interesting perspective, is the idea that some applications will be born in the cloud, get shifted in the cloud, and may ultimately get pulled back into the environment. That's one element that a lot of people don't think about is this idea of, I call it kind of graduation and demotion, right? I graduate you into the cloud, but I might demote you or I might revert back depending on the risk in the business or the scale. Does I mean, Sorry, does this happen often? It does. It does happen often, sometimes with cost, sometimes with core competency. Some organizations need certain data and it becomes very challenging to continue to migrate that data from one environment to another. And so they end up leaving it locally, quote unquote, you know, within their data center. It definitely happens in larger organizations. And then the second one kind of as similar mindset is multi-cloud. So it's lots of organizations really try to do this native security stack with a big focus on mapping their legacy or traditional on-premises controls and technologies. And they say, okay, we've got a really good handle on uh, cloud provider one. So we think we've got a good situation. And then they go through acquisition. They go through some sort of partnership that some other developer finds a very specific need to go to cloud provider two. And now they're in a multi-cloud strategy. So I, I've talked to a lot of organizations you know, in the course of maybe a two-year span. And they said, yep, we're going to this cloud provider and that's it. And then I talked to them two years later and they're like, yep, we're in four different cloud providers partly through acquisition, partly through needs uh, of the business, you know, in that case, this case, business means, you know, the developer or the DevOps engineer, someone has made a requirement that one cloud provider can't meet, right? Wow. That, that I'm assuming gets extremely sort of frustrating and confusing for, <laughs> for your clients. Let me ask you, Alan, back to the original question, what are these new costs of dealing with the security controls that people may not be aware of? 
I think Paul's addressed most of it, right? You've got your tooling, right? You've got your training, your people, and there's always, always, always a, a transfer of skills that has to take place. If you're embracing cloud for the first time, you don't want to lose your top tier technical talent. You're going to be doubling down and turning these people into cloud people. And, and that takes some effort and takes some real overhead. Tools wise, there's the specific tools unique to each cloud environment. I'm not going to name the major players. Everyone knows who they are. There's full tool suites available, but you've also got third party tools and, and, and niche tools and, and even conventional tools that have been ported to cloud capability. There's a lot of tooling there. And ultimately for me, you know, the, his, his question is, what are these new, uh, you know, what are these new things to be considered? And, and at the end of the day, I think what you've got to do is measure, right? You've got to, you've got to get in front of it. It's not just a matter of punching out and listing all the tools you have. You have to be thinking about it from the risk perspective. You have to be measuring your risk as it stands today, measuring it as it transfers to the cloud, and you need tools to do that. And those tools can help calculate the cost regardless of whether you're talking about people or tools. Awesome. Well, Alan, thank you so much. And thank you, Paul. Personally, I'm pretty enlightened on this. I, I must say that, it, you know, we find this happens a lot on this show where there are these, these theories that people have about technology that kind of gets cycled into an echo chamber. I'm thinking about the, the machine learning one we had with Davi, where everyone said garbage in, garbage out. And then after talking with him, you know, he pointed out to us that, oh, you know, it's far more nuanced and complicated like than that. And to this one, I keep hearing again and again, you know, get your SLAs in place. But geez, as you said, that's table stakes. There are a lot more issues you have to worry about and concern yourself with. And further down the road, as you pointed out. So, Paul, I, I appreciate your time. Alan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate Palo Alto Networks for sponsoring this episode and bringing you to us. Paul, I let you have the last word and please plug anything you'd like to say about Palo Alto Network. But first, Alan. I just want to thank Paul for coming out. This was a great conversation. And as far as, you know, measuring this kind of risk and assessing these kinds of tools and calculating costs, there's there's stuff that's out there. Glad to talk on LinkedIn about tools of my choice and, and standards that I've run into that I think are useful in this space. So let's keep the conversation going on LinkedIn. I think this one is definitely worthy of, of a longer term dialogue. And Paul, anything you'd like to see about Palo Alto Networks? And also, by the way, we ask everyone, are you hiring? <laughs> We are always hiring. We're growing at about, you know, 20 to 30 percent, depending on an annual basis. So we're growing and our business continues to grow as we're the leading cybersecurity company in the world at this point, which is great. That creates a lot of job opportunities. So, yes, hiring, hiring an internal CISO, actually, oh, wow. to okay. uh, mention that one. But, you know, as far as things that I like to like, I get excited about with Palo Alto Networks, it's it's our whole digital transformation of our internal organization. So, you know, we are continuing to, to invest heavily in cybersecurity, both internally and externally, but ultimately we're embracing the cloud internally for product development and for innovation. And we're seeing a lot of fruit with it. I call it cyber transformation. When you're embracing cloud for cyber good, you know, I coined it, you know, cyber transformation. And Palo Alto specifically has a whole suite called Prisma Cloud. And within that whole suite of products, we provide guardrails, visibility, network vulnerability, using a bunch of acquisitions that we made in the last two years to enable our customers to really be able to do multi-cloud and hybrid, because I'm seeing hybrid forever. I see lots of organizations continue to embrace their on-premises and cloud. So they need an enterprise strategy that allows them to embrace multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, and the future. Awesome. Well. It seems like you have the full suite there. So I appreciate it. So if you're interested, I'm assuming go to paloaltonetworks.com. Anywhere else you want to direct people? No, that, that's a good place to start. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Paul Kalatayud, CSO of Americas for Palo Alto Networks, and as well, my co-host, Alan Alford, and obviously you, the community, who contribute so much to our conversation. We greatly appreciate it. As you can plainly see, this show does not exist without you. So thank you again. So in closing, thank you for contributing and listening to Defense In Depth. We've reached the end of Defense In Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn, or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth.